Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. Dave, Dr. Cruz, how are you? Doing well, Dr. Tilly. I know, <laughs> that sounds weird coming to my side. I'm a PT, man. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, I'm surprised we haven't had you on the podcast by now after you know Ellen and Marcia and everybody, but it's great to have you on and complete the medical trio, I guess, that's going on. Yeah, well, I appreciate the invite. And uh, yeah, our USAG staff has just continued to grow with some uh, amazing individuals. And thanks for your support of them and including them. And I know you have a lot of initiatives um, going on uh, with various medical professionals in the gymnastics world. So uh, thanks for all the work that you're doing. Oh, it's my pleasure. I think I'm, you know, stuck between luck and uh, I don't know what you would call it. Maybe hard work meets luck. And here's a podcast. So four years later, it's still happening. And if people keep listening, I guess I'll just keep doing it for a while. You know, <laughs> that's where I'm at now. Um, love to have you on. And I would love to, you know, pick your brain about a lot of topics. I think that, you know, the, the world of puberty and growth and maturation is very overwhelming. I think from a medical provider's point of view, it's uh, really hard to manage some of these conditions. And I think from the parent coach, you know, athlete point of view, it's, it's a hurricane, man. It really is one of the hardest things to people to get through. So I love to maybe just kind of dive down that rabbit hole and chat with you a little bit before we do that though. Can you maybe uh, share with people just your, your journey through the medical side of USAG and where you are now and your role and things like that? Sure. Yeah. You know, a lot of us come to sports medicine from our own personal sports uh, experiences. And mm -hmm. of course, I grew up a gymnast and uh, made my way through the sport and had the opportunity, of course, to uh, compete in college and then be on the senior national team. And um, my career, unfortunately, ended with with injury uh, and uh, found myself a month later in medical school and off to the rest of my life. And um, but uh, as you go through that process, um, having the opportunity to circle back around to uh, the sport and the family uh, and mm you know, the gymnastics world to stay involved. So had the opportunity once I finished uh, training to get back involved with uh, USA Gymnastics. And so mm -hmm. that was around 2008. Um, mm -hmm. Started mostly with uh, the men's artistic program as I was getting involved again. Uh, and then just uh, kept volunteering, working events and uh, getting more ingrained with uh, medical staff and in particular with the men's artistic program. And then in 2016, of course, we had to hit complete reset and reboot and rebuild. Mm -hmm. um, so started to wear a couple different hats with the organization at that point as we were trying to uh, get to a better place. And so I had opportunities to work with all the disciplines at that point, um, mm -hmm. covered the Rio Olympic Games, and then uh, kind of rolled through that next quad. And, and as we kept uh, building our staff further and further for um, artistic uh, women's program, and then kept uh, supporting some of the other programs, started to kind of slowly step back from the day-to-day -day, uh, team physician role. Um, and then a few years ago, uh, we were able to continue to build the staff, create um, Athlete Health and Wellness Council and uh, chief position. And then that's when I stepped in a little bit more into the medical directorship role. Mm. So at this point over the last year or two, um, after I went to uh, Tokyo, was able to step back and hand over all the team physician duties. And over the last year and a half, have just been uh, trying to put in some work behind the scenes as medical director and support all of our staff and, and work on a lot of different initiatives. So it's a full journey like most of us. <laughs> and, uh, last uh, six, seven years have definitely been part struggle, uh, part excitement, part a um, uh, ton of work and a lot of uh, passion and energy from a lot of people. And I think we're getting to a, an okay place at this point. Yeah, I would agree there. And as someone who clearly knows the the deep inner workings of how challenging, you know, the medical side of the sport is and, and how challenging it is to just keep all the pieces afloat, you know, whether it's from athlete, actual clinical care to, stuff to the political pieces, like it's challenging. And so I thank you and Ellen and Marcia and everybody else who's on staff behind the scenes, really working hard to to keep the sport moving. You know, it's, it's no easy, it's no easy feat. I know that for sure. Um, and so on that piece of it, I think I'd like to dive into maybe some of the more challenging parts of, of working with clinical care and athlete care from your experiences. And, you know, the first thing that always comes to mind is I personally find that like the ages of 10 to 14 are just an absolute hurricane. Like I said, it's so hard to, you know, the sport is amazing and it's awesome, but we work with kids, right? We work with kids that are young and they're trying to really get on a, a challenging path from young ages. And so I'd like to maybe overview, you know, your thoughts on what maturation is and growth. And from there, maybe we can chop into some, some ideas and some thoughtful things. 
Yeah, I, I think that's always important just to have that that base of just what are we talking about? What what's what defines this concept of puberty or yeah. maturation? And so, you know, everybody's on the same page because then as you start to talk about uh, ways to help navigate that, it's important to have that knowledge base. So, yeah, I mean, maturation, you can think about it in a lot of different ways, but most people are familiar with that term puberty or pre-puberty or post-puberty essentially just talking about that uh, maturation process through adolescence. Um, when we think about maturation or just age, of course, you know, there's chronologic age. So just how old are you, you know, 10, 12, 14, 16. Um, but in terms of um, maturation, we think about in terms of biologic age. So uh, what's happening hormonally, what's happening uh, physically, emotionally, cognitively, you know, and of course, all of these influence, you know, what our athletes are doing in the gym in that in that moment of maturation. So you can kind of think about it as this stage of maturation. So where are they in the puberty process? Again, have they entered puberty? Or are they still pre-puberty? Um, and we could talk more later about how that plays into injury risk and, and how you think about uh, those stages. You can also think about the timing of it. So when, you know, when is an athlete, when is a gymnast entering puberty? So at, at what age are they entering it? Are they entering it fairly early? Are they entering it later in the process? So you can have um, uh, two gymnasts of the same age, say they are uh, 13, and one could be already in the maturation process or entering puberty, and one could be well off from that. And um well documented that it, that that range could be as as wide as uh, four years in that maturation process, despite the two gymnasts being the same chronologic age. Mm -hmm. So the timing is pretty critical in, in terms of how we think about it, athlete to athlete, and then just the the tempo as well. So how quickly are they going through that maturation process? Um, and that's variable, gender uh, to gender, uh, ethnicity, um, genetically. We're all predisposed in in different ways to enter that, that maturation process. So if you kind of just take a step back, step away from the chronologic concept mm -hmm. of age, and we just think about that puberty process and all those changes that happen. Um, and then as you start to dive into literature and the research and our knowledge and science, there's variation in just the physical maturation. So, you know, what's happening neuromuscularly, what's happening from a, just a general coordination standpoint, growth, um, height standpoint, Again, cognitively, what's happening, um, and from a, a performance uh, standpoint, you know what's happening in terms of ability to build muscle, agility, speed. Um, all of these things are influenced by maturation. So um, we can't uh, live in a hole and ignore that this process <laughs> is happening as we are working with athletes, and and not only how that affects their performance, but also keeping them healthy, which of course. Uh, that's um, our focus to make sure that they're happy and healthy as they go through this process and performing well. So it's very complex. And, and obviously, you know, that's why sometimes we, we just like to ignore it in sport performance and sport development because it's so complicated and it's really intimidating to think about ways of how to work with it instead of just ignoring it right. And moving on, right? Sure. Yeah. And I have some great follow-up questions there, I think, but can you really define what those ages are to guess around for male and female, like what to expect for a coach or a parent or an athlete themselves listening? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, female athletes tend to enter in, in, in general, and these are all just, you know, averages and generalities. Um, and again, there's a ton of variation gymnast to gymnast, but uh, female athletes tend to enter into that maturation process about two years earlier than male athletes. And that tends to be between 10 to 12 for, for girls, 12 to 14 for boys. Um, and we, and just as a reference point, as we talk later, um, we refer to uh, what's called the peak height velocity, which is basically that growth spurt that everybody kind of refers to. Uh, that peak height velocity is when they are um, entering and peaking in that maturation process. And so we, we think about the timing, um, the stages, uh, the tempo, all kind of in relation to that. So Usually for girls, 10 to 12, boys 12 to 14, they're starting to enter into that peak height velocity. 
Cool. Yeah, that's super helpful. And I think, you know, whenever I talk to people or they come to me, you know, on the medical side in the clinic, everyone is very aware of the physical changes, right? You grow a lot, you know, you have, you know, uh, open growth plates and you see someone's, you know, I always joke, they sit in the table and their legs are twice as long as their torso, right? It's like someone's like a giraffe and uh, you know, the physical aspects are happening, but I think it's really underappreciated or under discussed about the mental, the emotional, the hormonal changes that really change, you know, some of the psyche and the emotional components. And I feel like that sometimes is, is not swept into the rug, but it's not as as discussed about the physical preparation side. So could you maybe talk about what's happening emotionally and mentally? Because I think that will help people paint a picture of why they're seeing someone change personality wise in front of them, you know? Yeah. So, you know, and of course, these are usually the the challenges that we uh, joke about, you know, when, oh, you have a, a teenager at home, right? You know, and, and all these emotionality uh, changes. Um, but, you know, those are very natural maturation processes, right? So, you, you know, you have a child prepubescent that is just very, the brain uh, works in a way of being very accepting of their outside world, interacting with other human beings and adults and, and, um, uh, and you know, listening and following and, and trusting those adults around you, right? Um, and that has all kinds of implications in terms of our responsibility of coaches and medical professionals that working with these kids. But the normal natural thing for a human being as you start to get into adolescence and puberty is to start questioning the outside world, you know, start to develop your identity, start to develop your own personality. Um, but sometimes these don't always align with what the adults around them want for them, right? And so that creates that conflict of, you know, adolescence and having a teenager. But these are normal things, right? And so it, instead of, again, ignoring those, but, you know, starting to actually help develop and work with those and having the patience and the flexibility to understand that these are natural processes, mm -hmm. and we have to adjust to that in the way that we interact, communicate, be accepting of these uh, people that are growing and developing. So, you know, cognitively, um, so that's, you know, more the emotionality, personality, those changes that you're seeing, you know, those are normal changes. Um, and being flexible and patient with those. But, um, and then just cognitively, you know, again, there's, uh, as our brain is developing, um, our ability to um, uh, fit within a concept of learning or fit within a structured environment. So if you, um, if you, you kind of do a deep dive into uh, these concepts of athlete development or long-term athlete development as a, as a concept, you'll see on some of those charts, not only will they speak to uh the physical development and when you might focus on like um agility speed strength uh mm -hmm. they will also speak to when it's appropriate to have more um unstructured training and play and fun and kind of playing into cognitively where an athlete's mind is and how they can develop in a strong way um, and then as you go through that developmental process starting to get more and more structured more and more demanding um, in how you approach their training, just mm. the practice schedules and, and, um, and all those uh, aspects of, of how we train the athlete. And of course, also understanding that, you know, as our athletes get older, go through the maturation process, that's also happening in a lot of other social development circles, you know, and so understanding that our athletes entering into puberty uh, have a lot of shifting and changing forces outside the gym as well, that they're going to inevitably take into the gym. And, and, and again, we just need to be aware of that changes in family dynamics, friend dynamics, relationships, um, other things that they're starting to do and academically, uh, clubs, other things they're starting to be interested in. So all those mm. things are happening at this moment from a cognitive, social, emotionality, um, on top of, as you mentioned, just the physical changes that we're well aware of. Mm. And something you said, I think is really important to highlight is I think, you know, everyone's looking for like, okay, well, what do I do about this? How do I handle this, this storm that's coming, you know, when this, someone inevitably grows and changes. And I think, you know, what you said is so important, which is just uh, almost like embracing and leaning into the wind a little bit and accepting it's going to be part of what happens. Like if you're coaching with, you know, any young athlete, whether it's gymnastics or not, like this is an inevitable good thing in the long run, we need this to happen. And the more you can be educated about it and understand it and, and kind of be patient, right. And be empathetic to somebody who's going through this. I think that's the better, right? Because this isn't a day or week thing. This is a month or year thing. So the more you can equip yourself with skills about 
knowing about what's coming and being empathetic to the fact that if somebody has a short temper one day or if somebody's not in a great mood or if something is really hard for them, it's not their fault, right? They're not doing this by choice. They're struggling with it just as much as you probably see it from the outside. And so that's what comes to mind when you said that. But I'm curious if you have any other pieces of advice for parents or you know coaches who are working with this age group to maybe navigate that kind of cognitive, emotional, social piece of it. Yeah, you know, again, I think it's 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 awareness. Um, it's uh, being accepting or just taking a step back even and just um, uh, just asking simple questions. Hey, uh, I, I see that you're really frustrated. You're not learning this skill today. And, you know, uh, you seem to be um, much more upset about it. You know, is there anything else going on? You know, you know, just being willing to kind of take a step back, ask some simple questions, check in with them. Uh, you know, and, and, and in general, it's it's a nice kind of approach, I think, for uh, coaches, you know, just to have a, a quick um, check in with with your athletes as they come in each day. Right. You know, so you already understand kind of where they're coming from that day and and how hard you might be able to push them or, how, or mm -hmm. what you need to be aware of or um, already kind of be anticipating. You know, if you just have that simple check in, hey, how's it going today? How was school? Um, anything, you know, going on, you know, et cetera. Um, but if you do see, or you are kind of struggling the moment, uh, just kind of, uh, it, you know, taking a, a pause and a step back, um, you know, that, <laughs> you know, that's true for coaches is true for, mm -hmm. for parents, you know, so personal anecdote, you know, I got home last night from work, long, long day, right. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. Um, I haven't eaten dinner yet. Um, first thing I see when I walk in is my son trying to do algebra and he's like, he's, he's a little tearful. Right. And so I'm like, okay, pause. Um, <laughs> let's, let's assess the situation, help him through the problem a little bit, and then just take a moment and say, Hey, look, you know, I, you seem a lot more frustrated with this, with this problem than I usually see you, you know, is, is, how was your day? Was mm -hmm. it a long day? Um, anything else going on? You know, just taking that moment to um, just kind of check in. Um, and uh, I think that aligns well with, uh, you know, um, I listened to your uh, episode with Dr. Faustin about mental health. And you guys talked about, you know, that kind of just check in or just being willing to take a moment and ask that simple question. And, and that goes a long way to understand what's happening in the moment, what you can do for your athlete, mm -hmm. uh, that role you can play in that moment. Um, and then, you know, that just goes a long way also in terms of developing the um, a healthy relationship, you know, with mm -hmm with your athletes too. Mm, that's fantastic. I love that. And it's the timing of it's really great because I was listening to a podcast with Simon Sinek and he was talking about how, you know, in our culture post, you know, COVID or whatever, I think sometimes we're well-intentioned wanting to help somebody and fix something if they're going through something, but that's oftentimes not what people need. You know, sometimes they just need you to sit in the mud with them. As he said, you know, just be there and listen. And, you know, we all know how good it feels cathartically sometimes to vent a little bit and kind of get something off our chest and talk to a beloved friend who's not going to share it with anybody, but we'll just sit there and be like, yeah, that's hard. You know, there's been many times where I think in the gym and, but also outside the gym, it's, you know, there's nothing that someone did wrong. There's no problem. It's just life is to ups and downs and turns. And, you know, in this situation of context, puberty is hard and it's, it's not fun sometimes. And if you can just be with someone and say like, you know, are you okay? And like, do you, do you want to hear anything and, and not trying to fix them right away, but just letting it kind of come out. I found that some of my more transformative moments with younger female athletes that I coach was not me giving any grandiose, you know, Yoda advice or wisdom. It was just being like, yeah, tell me more. Mm -hmm. Go on. Like, oh, yeah, that's a bummer. And just validating and allowing that space for it to breathe. I think that goes underlooked sometimes. And obviously, in the context of the gym, you're in the middle of a bar rotation, right? It's not the time or the place, but five minutes after practice or a separate meeting or sometimes stuff, just that really goes a long way, I think, with young athletes sometimes. Yeah, 100% agree. Yeah. And on that, too, as well, another thing that just popped out as you were saying that is, I think, the pressure in gymnastics sometimes is that this is interrupting a plan, right? We have a meet, we have some sort of progression, this injury is getting in the way. And I think that the athlete understands that and you understand that, but we have to remember that uh, a puberty situation, the social judgment from other people that they perceive is really heavy in that, you know, changing body, changing life, changing gymnastics career. And so I think sometimes other things that are really helpful for coaches and parents is to take the pressure off of them for them, you know, like, we don't have to do this meet, you know, you don't have to compete if your knees are bugging you in this meet or, you know, States is down the road, but it's okay. Like you have plenty more years in gymnastics. And sometimes that, that like pressure valve release from the competition point of view, I think is really important. So I'm not sure if you have experience there. I want to share on that. Yeah. I, I mean, the timing is critical, you know, just so you, um, uh, 
uh, understands um, the environment and not, not only for, again, what's going on with the athlete, but everything around you. Um, and, and again, you know, whether it's uh, me talking to my son and finding a moment after working through the program or not in the middle of bars routine, maybe after maybe their parents there kind of have a conversation off to the side. Um, but also, yeah, in, in the moment of a long season and a long competitive schedule, uh, the timing can be critical and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be one grandiose, amazing movie script conversation that you have at one time, right? It's, it's recognizing and then having that growing conversation as you go, like, okay, here's where we are now. Um, we're, we're not heading the right direction. You know, you got this pain or we're struggling with this, or we got a lot going on outside the gym have a conversation. Okay. Everybody's aware. All right. Let's, let's come up with a plan or, or here's maybe we can make some adjustments and then the willingness to kind of keep checking in mm. uh, and then um, saying, okay, at the next checkpoint, this is what we're going to decide. Right. Mm. And so then you say, all right, if we get to this point and X, Y, or Z are happening, then, you know, maybe this isn't the right time to uh, maybe we need to take a step back or if, if we are meeting these goals and okay, let's keep going. Uh, so having those checkpoints, not having to make, the decision on everything all in one moment, right. um, keeping that conversation going again, those checkpoints of, um, how are we doing? Are we, uh, how's it going? Did you have that checkup with so-and-so, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's, um, physical or mental health or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just making shared decisions as we go, right. And involving all those stakeholders, you know, these are all the, the buzzwords, but it, it means a lot, right. To, to involve everybody in the picture involve everybody that can support that athlete. Um, so you're not making that decision on your own, you know, and it's not, um, it, it's, it's a, it's a group decision. So, uh, there's this, um, fun saying, um, where, you know, we talk about shared decision-making, uh, and so, um, some people's view of, of a, a shared decision could be, uh, just walking in the room with people and just sharing what my decision is, right. Mm. <laughs> is, uh, except actually having a, a true shared decision. Yeah. Everybody's input. So, um, but I think that's, you know, not, not again, not putting it all on yourself, not feeling the pressure to make all those decisions, um, being willing to um, involve others, having those checkpoints uh, and, and kind of going through that process. And then the end, you know, maybe it is the right decision for an athlete to take a step back or not compete at a certain event or mm. um, make some adjustments and those goals for that season. Yeah. And I can definitely back up maybe a little clinical trick or a pearl, but like, I think oftentimes when people come to me and they're asking about the whole season, right. It's like, you know, in this podcast, it's May, right. So we're close to him, but they come to me in November and like my back hurts or my knees are bugging me because I'm growing. Like, you know, I'm, I'm scared. I can't compete this season. And I think sometimes when you look at that large of a macro view, it's really overwhelming for that much, you know, oh my God, I can't believe I'm missing the whole season, but you just like give these things in two week increments, right. Or like four week increments, like, you know what? Well, we definitely need to back off a little bit now, but like, let's revisit this in two weeks after we've really modified quite a bit, talk to your coach, talk to everybody and gotten everyone on the same page. We'll reevaluate in two to four weeks and we'll make a decision there about the next two to four weeks. And if you just keep attacking, you know, one chunk at a time, I think that's really, really uh, easier to chew on, but also is trying to still find as many things as possible to keep them involved, to keep them going, to keep them kind of in the gym and training. I think that's really important too as well. And that's the value of getting a coach on board is if you have a coach, a parent, maybe a strength conditioning coach and yourself all discussing what are options for things we still can do, it might not be full training volume or whatever, but I think that's really important. The worst thing you can do for an athlete who is going through puberty and is really uh, maybe struggling already with the social mental part and then has an injury is pull them away from their friends and competition and all their social connections. Like that, that oftentimes lead to some, some dark mental health places because they feel like this is the worst thing ever. It's all caving in. So yeah, a little bit of a ramble there, but definitely think that uh, the more you can, uh, small chunks, you know, than like big grandiose things, probably the better. Mm -hmm. 100%. Um, and we, we chatted a little bit, uh, on injuries, right. And how like that is a big part of what we're dealing with. And I'd love to pivot the conversation towards, uh, you know, what common things are people dealing with in these age groups of like, you know, certain injuries or, you know, things that are particularly important for coaches and parents to kind of keep an ear to the ground on. Cause they kind of spiral out of control fast sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, you know, in that concept of maturation, right. So you're, you're pairing this, this rapid growth phase, you know, in, in stature, mass, uh, strength changes, um, mismatches in the, the, the physical, um, uh, um, um, uh, balances of, of, as you mentioned earlier, like you put that athlete on the table and they look like a giraffe, right? So 
you know, legs growing and then torso growing and then upper extremity growing and all these mismatches that happen, mm -hmm. bone growth versus soft tissue. You're pairing all of those changes uh, in our sport at a time when a um, at this age group, right, this kind of 12, 14, 16, they are hitting that peak in intensity and development in the sport. So mm -hmm. you have this complete mismatch of what's happening physically um, with the sport demand. And so, you know, that just creates this setup, potentially not for everybody, but potentially of injury. And so, you know, these are these uh, common um, types of things like growth plate injuries you, you mentioned earlier. Um, and that could be either acute injury, you know, because mm -hmm. we have these um, open growth plates and those are kind of the weakest point in the system, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so those are at risk for injury, but also uh, chronic overuse of those growth plates, whether mm -hmm. it's um, uh, the effect on the actual growth. So mm -hmm. things like uh, gymnast wrist, where the growth plate um, uh, is um, halted in its development. And so that creates mismatches um, at the wrist. Um, but you can also see overuse irritation patterns like uh, Seavers, Ajka Slaughter, uh, there's there's a, a few of them around the body where you have these big muscles and tendons attaching on growth plates and causing, you know, a constant stress and pain, mm -hmm. um, stress fractures, you know, during this moment of um, adolescence and maturation, um, it creates this uh, bone metabolism um, imbalance that can, for a period of time during that peak height velocity, uh, the bone density can be decreased. Mm. So there's a higher risk for fractures, higher risk for stress injuries of the bone. So we, we see all these things start to crop up um, in this age group. Uh, and then if you really dive into literature, sometimes you can then predict a little bit more in terms of um, what types of these overuse injuries might happen as they're entering peak height, at peak height, a little bit after peak height velocity. So, but yeah. in that phase, you know, we, if you've been in the sport long enough, you're going to be familiar with with all of these overuse things, <laughs> you know, in gyms because of that that um, balance of growth and sport demand. Sure, yeah, and, and you know, all these things, like you said, have a you know whether it's Severs, Osgood, I think Hamstring, like I said, is gym. A lot of these things just have an overlapping, you know, crossroads of rapid growth, high force sport, you know, in a period where they're trying to do a lot of volume. And unfortunately, there's just a mismatch of workload and capacity because of the, the nature of the beast with these timelines. And in the long run, you know, this is great that they're going to get stronger and faster and more powerful and, you know, have a full length development. But in the short term, it's very frustrating for people to try to deal with because they're trying to maintain progress, but they're always limited by, you know, impact volume or some sort of repetition. And I'm curious if you have um, advice or thoughts for, for people who are coming to you with these like very acute kind of hot injuries as a physician, what are you recommending for them? And maybe the, the next two to four to six to eight weeks to maybe try to, I guess, like deal with it and address it, but still keep them in forward momentum pattern, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing is just rooted in um, wh what is, what is the problem and, and what is uh, safe uh, to continue or what is, uh, something that we just have to shut down. Right. So I always kind of talk about, there's like two buckets of injury or pain. You know, there's a bucket that, you know, overuse, um, irritation, uh, just stress that can create pain, but it's not correlating with something that's structurally concerning mm. in a, a future health of that area or of the gymnast versus the bucket of pain and injury where there is something structurally going on that unfortunately we just have to protect. We just have to let it heal. We just have to shut it down. So now a lot of these overuse things that we'll see in this age group, like the apophysitis conditions, Ajka slot receivers, um, uh, some of these um, kind of mismatch uh, pain patterns. Those are things that if we, you know, if I'm with that gymnast or athlete in the office, we're identifying it, we're talking about the history, doing an exam, maybe doing some imaging and we say, okay, Everything seems healthy, healthy. Everything seems safe. Um, let's figure out how we're going to get past this. Um, let's also figure out um, how to prevent the next episode. Uh, and then let's also talk about what we can do right now to stay engaged, you know, not be socially isolated, as you mentioned earlier, um, work on uh, continued fitness, uh, you know, sport of gymnastics, um, sometimes we uh, lament about the complexity of it and the events and the whole body nature of it. The positive of that is if we have an injury, there are maybe a lot of other things that we can be doing that aren't using that body part, right? So mm. um, 
so it's kind of identifying, uh, okay, where's where are we in that safety profile? Uh, but then, all right, let's um, let's come up with this plan to fix this problem. That could be physical therapy. It could be a little bit of therapeutic relief. Uh, it mm -hmm. could be protecting it a little bit more outside of the gym. You know, uh, limiting other types of things that might stress it. All right, let's get plugged into some PT, some retraining. Uh, let's figure out uh, what led to this. You know, where where is that individual's mismatch? Uh, that we're talking mm. about what led them biomechanically to have this issue start working on that so that mm -hmm. uh, we're not only fixing the problem but as we are working through the problem they're going to come out on the other end in a better place um and then third which you know so that's about 10 percent of the visit 90 percent of the visit is spending all right what are we going to do in the gym how are we going to figure this out what can we still be doing what's going to be our yeah. training plan What's our progression? You know, um, can we still be doing bars, parallel bars? Uh, can we still mm -hmm. be doing some tramp? Can we, you know, um, uh, versus, all right, this is lower extremity thing. So we're going to have to really limit, you know, um, landings, hard surfaces. Maybe we do tumble track, uh, you know, et cetera. So it's trying to kind of tease that out, right? Um, and find that balance. But that takes a ton of time, right? You know, and it takes a lot of shared conversation too, right? And developing those sure relationships between medical professional and coaches and, and the parents. And, um, uh, and I think one thing that's lost oftentimes is the athlete too, right? You know, so the athletes understanding of what's happening with their body, why are mm. we doing these things? Uh, why are we making these decisions to pull back for a little bit of time? Um, of course the harder conversations are like, Hey, you look, you have a stress fracture. Unfortunately, there's the only, there's only one way to let this heal is just, yeah. you got to shut it down. Um, yeah. but why, you know, why are we making these decisions um, that off, oftentimes can help some of the emotionality of injury, the understanding, the plan. So then kind of come back and conceptualize um, what the plan is and see, see the light at the end of the tunnel. So mm. um, yeah. just kind of work out all those nuances. Yeah, I love all that. And I think that one thing that really is important you mentioned the other is the is the athlete's involvement and in kind of making it about them in a good way, which is nine times out of 10, when you ask an athlete, what do you want out of gymnastics? What are your goals? What do you have? They often have a larger big picture goal, a meet, a level, a score, happy with my friends, whatever. And if you can reverse engineer why it's a good decision to make a short term change for a long term progress, oftentimes some light bulbs go off. And like, you know, I know you and I both work with some pretty high level athletes with high level goals. And sometimes their goal is one, two, four years down the road. And you're like, all right, well, three months now might be worth three years later in your career, whether that's college or uh, some international event. And I think that helps them not, I mean, it still sucks, you know, that's the reality, but it helps them digest it a little bit more comfortably. And the other piece, I think I can offer some insight from the clinical side of PT is the ability to really understand the sport and slowly get somebody back in safely over two to four weeks. I think is massive for a lot of these growth plate type things like that. They tend to be riding the roller coaster. It feels awful. So they completely shut things down. They wait four weeks, they go back to floor and it flares their knees up like crazy. But I think the value of understanding the sport and working with coaches to say, what equipment do you have? What drills do you have? What things can we do? You know, that's really, really important because if they slowly over four weeks have an expected timeline to get back to something that's very different than I went back, my knees hurt right away. And now they're doubly as frustrated on the other side, you know, for sure. Yeah. hundred percent. And then on that, I think the last piece I'd like to talk about is just kind of maybe zooming out a little bit and talking about if you have any, um, ideas or thoughts about maybe not, I, don't, I hate the word preventative measures, but like injury risk reduction strategies are probably the formal PR term we should use. Tim Gavitt would thank us for that <laughs> and not put his research on blast. But I'm wondering if you have any uh, ideas for coaches or those who maybe are on the other side of an injury or a coach is listening and they unfortunately deal with a lot of odds good every season, if there's any things that we know in the research to help out. Yeah. So there's a lot of layers to that. Um, and, you know, I think it is important to take a step back and, and just have a touch point on research and the literature because, uh, you know, unfortunately there's not a lot, right. You know, the, a, a lot of what we have in sport performance, sport injury, injury prevention, a lot of the studies are in adult athletes and there's mm -hmm. not a lot of studies really looking at youth athletes. And then in particular, as you dive in, um, injury prevention, maturation processes, uh, there's a lot of, uh, variables that are hard to control for to do a really solid study for that. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, there is some really great work that's out there. There's a lot of um, investigation going on now. Um, and then if you just extrapolate out a little bit, there are some basic principles that we know can be really helpful. Um, you know, one is, is 
if, if we if we know that there's a mismatch right with the training the maturation process it's uh there, there's a couple concepts in terms of how we can maybe predict when an athlete is heading into that peak phase mm -hmm. uh and where their injury risk is going to be the greatest and then if you have some strategies uh to then adjust and to be aware of um then, you know, that can be helpful from an injury uh, prevention standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's, there's still some work to do, I think, in terms of our ability to predict, but there are some formulas out there, like um, uh, percentage of predicted adult height and where they are compared to that and, and be mm -hmm. able to see where they are in that peak height velocity. But um, awareness is the key, right? So if, if uh, just like we were talking about earlier with the um, cognitive and emotionality and socially what's happening with our athletes if we are also aware and can identify when each individual athlete is entering into that phase uh, then we can start to um, adjust uh, some of the numbers some of the repetition uh, we can adjust uh, just um, volume and breaks from sport uh, identifying these uh, issues of overuse early um, having a culture and environment in the gym where uh, the gymnast can feel comfortable to say, hey, this has been building for the last few days or for the last couple of weeks, yeah. uh, my, my heel is hurting, then uh, starting to look at, all right, let's pull back on some numbers. Um, where do you feel at the most? Let's make some adjustments or modifications. Hey, go, go get that checked out. Um, make sure we're not missing something more concerning. Um, and so a little bit of that kind of prevention, working with the volume, uh, in the, the, uh, repetition, uh, there's also a lot of work, uh, obviously you're, you can speak to this more than I can, but when it comes to, uh, preseason, uh, conditioning and fitness, mm -hmm. when it comes to, uh, neuromuscular training programs, yep. uh, you know, again, one, one big issue for both acute and chronic injuries with these maturing athletes is that, um, it's well-documented that their neuromuscular control changes, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we can um, combat that with a neuromuscular training program, then, um, then we can hopefully prevent some of these injuries. So, you know, having that as, as just a um, base routine and approach within your gym, uh, anybody in this certain phase of maturation is going to do this program, yep. um, you know, and, and having uh, that neuromuscular uh, training or retraining if we're post-injury uh, to, um, facilitate the return, but also prevention of injury. Nutrition, right? Ton of work with nutrition, um, having your athletes properly fueled, a lot of layers of that, a lot of resources though, thankfully mm -hmm. for that, um, to look at a robust approach. Uh, a lot of good um, research going on with sleep, right? And so, you know, that goes back to what we were talking about earlier. There's a lot going on outside the gym that is going to influence um, any, any athlete in terms of, um, sleep schedules, uh, you know, um, what's happening at home, uh, there, and there can be a big disparity too, right. Where, depending on where you're located, um, the, uh, diversity of your gym, um, and unfortunately, you know, some of that, those inequities that are going to affect different athletes in different ways, you know, the resources for nutrition, um, their home environment to support, um, a, a good solid, uh, amount of sleep. Um, but, are they entering high school and now all of a sudden their workload and academic demands have, have exploded. So they're getting six hours of sleep every night. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, sleep is, is a huge layer to that. Now, some of these, obviously the coaches uh, don't have a lot of control over, but again, it can be supportive. It can be awareness. Maybe you're not changing it, but if you know an athlete is entering into high school, um, uh, uh, testing or finals for the first time and they're you know it's they're in that week or two and but you're aware of that then maybe you're going to adjust some of the volume or right. some of the, the numbers that they're doing so uh being aware of nutrition resources and sleep and what's happening at home you know and making adjustments accordingly of course these are all fine in theory right but if you're in the middle of a season you have a busy gym you're coaching four different teams like how are you going to really be able to dive into the details with each individual athlete, adjust training programs, make them individualized. Uh, that's really hard to do. Yep. But um, again, I, I think it's just uh, some uh, awareness and then uh, and, and, and knowing what you can modify and support mm -hmm. uh, 
and then try to make as many adjustments as we can. Um, and, and we can dive into a lot of other details in terms of um, other, other theories or philosophies in how you approach the training of, of a maturing athlete and where they are in that maturation process. And there's concepts like um, bio banding and load resistance. And, um, it, it's, it's complex. I think that's a lot of work that, um, USAG can do in the future while we're yeah. having these conversations, yeah. uh, your initiatives, uh, the education process, uh, and maybe we can start to develop some, uh, techniques, programs, policies, uh, that help support this kind of individualized mm. approach to training, uh, based on where an athlete's at in their maturation process. Mm. But yeah, the long-winded answer, but there's, there's so many, there's so many ways to this that, I mean, you, we could talk for hours about it. Yeah. I mean, when you hear all of that from the, from the get, you know, you say like, Oh wow, that's like, there's a lot of, like you said, layers to that conversation, but I think people should flip that and view that as a positive, that there are a lot of levers you can pull on to try to help somebody. And I think that the best way that a coach or a parent or someone, even in a gym culture in general to maybe try to make sure you're covering those is to either a try to develop a network of people who you can either put a handout or sort of a links resources, or, you know, whether it's our stuff or whether it's stuff from Christina and other nutritionists or sleep experts or books, like there are so many podcasts and blogs and tools and people that you can essentially make a, a handout, you know, uh, that goes out to your parent uh, deck every year that says like, you know, this is part of our education and athlete wellness piece is to try to get you information that's high quality and research based of someone who's summarizing this for you. So here are a couple of things on sleep, a couple of things on feeling well, a couple of things on, uh, you know, whatever time management or mental health, and just put them in a PDF that somebody can just click and, and read about and listen to. I think that's a, a really great way to do it. Because as you said, you know, I know the reality of being a coach with 12 female athletes in front of me. And it's very challenging to have all those little nuanced conversations. And I think in many times, I'm not the person to have that conversation contextually. And so I need to find somebody else who is more well versed there. But I think that's a great way to do it is just find a collection of, of well trusted resources and put them into a parent handbook or put them into an athlete handbook or put them into a coaching educational seminar, and then teach your staff about it. You know, it doesn't have to all rest on your shoulders to be there on Google at two in the, two in the morning trying to find this all. <laughs> Um, and then I guess, uh, I'd like to maybe hear your thoughts on how this applies to the medical side of things as, you know, PTs, ATs, physicians who are working in the space, maybe in the context of, of your lecture and kind of the things that you feel it's important for the, the actual, uh, clinicians to, to hear about versus the parents and the coaches. Yeah. So, I mean, then you start to dive a little bit more into just the biomechanics of things, um, and these injury profiles. Um, and as we're working with these athletes, I think. So, you know, obviously, if you're li listening to this podcast, you probably have some sort of um, interest or history <laughs> of gymnastics. Um, but uh, if you're not as familiar, uh, understanding, you know, what these athletes are going through, understanding um, or just having those conversations with the athletes uh, in terms of uh, what their volume is, um, uh, their gym environment, what level they are, where they are in their competitive season, it, it, all of these um uh, influence how we might adjust our approach, the timing of the recovery, how hard we're going to push something. Again, thinking about things in terms of the safety profile, um, what leeway do we have? You know, the first way to disenfranchise your athlete is uh, one to just have really definitive, um, you're not going back for this competition or, um, or um, not engaging them uh, in that conversation. Um, and then also to not um, helping them understand why these decisions are being made, right? And so if you can have some, if appropriate, some flexibility and, and, and as you mentioned earlier, like, okay, we're going to focus on the next two weeks and then we're going to go to these two weeks and then your competitions in six weeks. So we're going to meet these milestones as we go, not just saying, yep, six weeks, you're not going to do it. Yep. Um, and even if you have in the back of your mind that, okay, it's probably unlikely that we're going to get there, mm. but, you know, again, in, in engaging that athlete in that decision-making going one step at a time, taking them through that process, uh, giving it a chance, mm. uh, being rooted in, a, in what's safe in that progression. And then in the end, if you can kind of get to a place where, again, it's a shared decision and that athlete, because you've spelled it out for them and we've gone through those, those milestones, 
uh, they come to the conclusion of like, yeah, I'm not ready. Or yes, the, the right decision is to not compete. Mm-hmm. That goes um, a long way, um, both in the acceptance of what that injury means, um, the conclusion of not competing, mm-hmm. your relationship with that athlete, um, their future just um, <laughs> perception of that injury and what it meant for them, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it goes a long way to engage them in that process. Um, in that flexibility, you know, again, that, it, that takes extra time. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, so that's more of like a nuance of just working with these levels of athletes, right. And, in that flexibility, um, uh, of course, when it comes to injury to injury, uh, there are a lot of ways to work at gymnast back to the sport, um, in these kind of return to play, uh, programs. I'll, I'll give a shout out for Dr. Emily Sweeney, uh, published mm-hmm. study, um, or a kind of um, consensus on return to play in gymnastics for different injuries for uh, female and male artistic. Mm-hmm. It's a great resource um, mm-hmm. to get us a really good sense of event to event, skill to skill, um, how we would think about getting back to female um, uh, artistic gymnastics from a leg injury, from a shoulder injury. Um and so, uh, you know, building a little bit of a knowledge base on how to work with these athletes, getting them back, um, mm-hmm. getting them back safely, getting back efficiently and, and helping them through that decision making. Um, so there's there are a lot of resources out there like that. Um, <laughs> then I would also, you know, direct uh, other medical professionals uh, to the USAG website, um, you know, through our Athlete Health and Wellness Council. Uh, we've over the last uh, three to four years have really worked hard to start building out the the content and the resources um and um kind of the information on uh various uh uh, areas of uh, athlete health and wellness Uh, Mm -hmm. so on the website uh, there's a landing page and has a lot of links to various uh, pdfs and articles and webinars recorded lectures on on uh, all kinds of topics you know spanning mental health nutrition um, injury prevention etc so uh, there are some good resources there Um, And then again, I think uh, as we move forward, uh, people like yourself, uh, other individuals in the community um, that have supported the gymnastics community for a long time and USAG, there's a lot of initiatives to start building out the research literature, Mm -hmm. uh, understanding more about our sport. um, And so uh, continuing to look for those things as we as we build that knowledge base, I think will be important. Yeah. That's great. And you stole the best last question out of my mouth. I was going to ask about the athlete wellness stuff, but you, you so elegantly just filled in that sand hole. So th- thanks for finishing the podcast up pretty well. Um, well, this is great. I think this is a really good digestible, you know, chunk for people to chew on, whether you're parent, coach, medical provider. I think there's a lot of uh, important pieces in there about how to, how to navigate some of these troublesome years. So I think we'll leave it there because I know you're a busy man yourself, but I, uh, I appreciate you hopping on and sharing your expertise for a little bit. Yeah, no, thanks a lot. It was great. Um, look forward to future conversations, future work. Keep everybody happy and healthy. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.